Facebook friends, I have a special guest that I'm going to be interviewing today, Dr. Angela Loria. She's special to me because not only is she my book mentor, she's my book publisher as well. And she helped me achieve a special 10 year dream of mine. And it's all wrapped up in this nice little book called The All-Inclusive Diet. And I wrote this book with Angela, uh, with her program, The Author's Incubator. And it was literally a 10 year dream for me. And I had a lot of fears that were holding me back. And Angela basically took my hand rather aggressively, I might add, and pulled me out of that stuck place and got me to a place where I actually delivered my message. It was uh, me making the difference. And this is Angela's, I believe it was your first book, or per, yeah, it was your first book. And, and this is actually how I got to know Angela. It was, it was through this book that I'd read. And it was through that book that I read that I got the confidence to give Angela a call, and, which led to me being part of her author incubator program, which led to me becoming a published author. It still feels weird saying that, by the way. Um, better yet, uh, an Amazon number one bestseller, which also led me to um, another publisher, a traditional publisher, Morgan James, uh, your partner, which now, as of June 13th, I'm going to have my published book in bookstores. And that was not something that um, I even dreamed about, to be honest with you. And, it, it was and they'll probably be hitting bookstores soon. They've been coming like two or three weeks before the actual oh. pub dates. Wow. Been seeing wow. Them, so like, make sure you have, like, if you guys haven't pre-ordered Chris's book on Amazon, if you pre-order it, it'll probably be arriving in like days. Amazing. Amazing. So um, the reason why I've got you on here, Angela, is to, to share with my Facebook friends um, that may be in the same place I was uh, about a year ago, actually. It was a year ago that um, that we basically started writing this book. It was published in July, if you recall, from last year. And uh, if you're in that place, too, where you've got a message and you want to make a difference and perhaps, you know, you just don't have the, the confidence or the know-how uh, to get out of that stuck place that I was in for 10 years, then, you know, Angela has been my mentor for that. So I want to introduce you to anyone that is in that same place that I was. And the best way to do that is the three questions I ask all all the people that come on this show and that would be what do you do for fun so we can get a better idea of who the real Angela is second what are you famous for and third what is the hardest thing that you've ever had to overcome in your life what happened and how did you do it so we'll start off with number one what do you do for fun Angela well, I have a new for fun answer it's very new and she may make an appearance but I have a very cute brand new kitten. So my latest, what do you do for fun, has been playing with my kitten who is amazing. But I actually wanna share that as a practical thing too. I am not somebody, and I know there are many entrepreneurs like this, I'm not somebody that's awesome at relaxing. So if you are watching and you are not awesome at relaxing, you can go ahead and share that in the comments. So um, I knew I wouldn't make Time to relax. I'm really good at meditating, but I call it, um, I have a functional medicine doctor and I always call it competitive meditating. <laughs> like I do it like a, I'm going to get 28 minutes today. <laughs> and you know, it's like another item on my to-do list. I'll aggressively meditate. And if I'm like getting sleep, I'm like a new, a mom of a newborn doing like aggressive sleep training. I will get eight hours and not a minute less and not a minute more. But bringing play in is really hard for me. And like, there's nothing cuter than a kitten. So she is just super fun. She's napping right now, but she's super fun. And so I've been just playing with her when she wants to play because she's cute and I, there's no agenda and it's not like competitive. So anyway, I noticed I was a little afraid to get a dog, but I noticed with my clients who have dogs, they take their dogs for walks and it's not like, a part of their business. They could just go for a walk. So do you find you get the same benefits or similar benefits as to when you meditate, uh, when you're playing with your cat? No, but that's probably because I'm into competitive meditating. I'm like, I will at least three, like I count when I get, hi Marissa, 
um, when I get competitive, when I get uh, insights for meditation, I like note it. And then I'm like, I want at least 20% of the time when I'm meditating to get an insight. You know, like I have criteria for successful meditation. Yeah, I, I love what uh, no criteria with a cat. I'm just pl- like, I don't know yeah. if I'm doing it right. It's fine. I'm just. Yeah, you called it playing. And I think that's a really cool way of looking at it because, you know, in the book, I, I ask people in the relaxing section of the book, I ask them, what do you do for fun is an acronym. It's, it's for what can you do frequently that's completely unnecessary, has nothing to do with your message or your mission or your business. Um, but what brings you to present? And, you know, what is nurturing? And that's the acronym for fun. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get into uh, the competitive meditation, as you called it. It might just be something that, you know, brings you back to the point where uh, time stands still. And we can call that presentness. Totally. And that is not easy for me. Oh, I will say the other time, and this is quite convenient, but the other time where that does happen for me is writing. So that works out well, considering my job. Um, So let's talk about that. You know, what are you exactly famous for? And if you can bring us through that journey. Yeah, totally. So I think for me, the author incubator is really about nurturing authors from an idea to being a published and hopefully best-selling author that's changing people's lives. And I think what I'm famous for and what I do differently than anybody else in the book industry is the book is really a byproduct of creating a bigger vision that the book is just a part of. So all of my clients, just like you, finish their book. Many of them do not think they will. Um, but really the author incubator as opposed to the book in- incubator or hiring an editor or a book coach, that's about the book. But I sort of go beyond the book to the person who is the person who wrote the book. And we kind of get you into your future self. And then the book is kind of done. I mean, you still have to do the work. But I mean, as you know, you got your first draft done in three days and three days plus 10 years. (laughs) So many people spend a long time doing something that you can bang out in three days. If I could just add to that, uh, something that you led us through was, uh, I guess you could call it a, a guided meditation or a visualization um, type of session. And that's how we started things off at the author's castle where you live, where authors are born. And it was it was so cool. And, and I, honestly, Angela, I'll never forget it because you were able to, to get me into um, my author's uh, shoes basically and, and start, you know, thinking like her, you know, um, looking at life like she would and, and all of these things. And, and I actually named her during that session. Her name was Josephine and, and she's, you know, the, the character, the main character of my book or, or the client that I coach, you know, through to a, a lifestyle transformation from the inside out. But I'll never forget that. Most people tell me that at some point after they did their book, they meet their ideal reader. Like, has a Josephine walked into your life in the last year? Yeah. 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 And you're like, oh, my God, I know you. We met, You don't know this, but we met at the author castle. Like, yeah. Yeah. So that was just an incredible experience and not not one that I would expect. You know, I, I thought it was more about the formalities and, and the structure and, and basically all of the, the technical things of, of writing a book. Uh, but you basically, you, you put me inside the book, essentially, you know, and I became a part of the book. And that was just an amazing experience. Totally. That's that's what I'm famous for. Yes. I yes. don't know about famous, but that's what I have the most fun doing. So let's move on to the third question, which is, you know, what is the, the most challenging thing that you've had to overcome in your life and what happened? Well, I think you probably know the answer to this one. Um, so definitely my biggest personal challenge is that I've lost a hundred pounds, not once, not twice, but five times. The first time, um, I remember very clearly I dialed 1-800-92-JENNY and I did Jenny Craig and I started in July of 1992 and it took me a whole year and I went from a size 20 to a size 12 and it felt amazing. 
And then in about three months, I was back to a size 18 and eventually gained back about 150 pounds of the 100 pounds I lost. Um, and then spent a couple of years back up in the 200s. And then I found Nutrisystem and lost about 100 pounds and got down to, I think, 177 pounds. Took me about a year. And then as soon as I get down to about a size 14, maybe a size 12, I, within three months, had gained back 100 pounds, worked my way back up into the mid 200s and maybe the upper 200s, and then sat there for a couple of years. And then I did Weight Watchers, got really good at counting points. That works. That's a great way to lose weight. Uh, if you don't deal with the underlying issues, though, you'll gain that back. So lost 100 pounds, took about a year, gained it back in about three months. Then I started moving towards the 300s and getting pre-diabetic and a whole bunch of health complications. So I hired a personal trainer and I hired a, um, a nutritionist and I went wheat free and dairy free and gluten free and uh, what was the other free? Something else free. Anyway, I don't know what the hell I was eating. Wheat and berries. And hi, Amanda. And oh, Amanda, hi. Um, and then I lost 100 pounds again and I knew that time it was going to be permanent. And then I met my husband and then I got married and I was 180 pounds on my wedding day and I was in like a size 12 or 14 and I was like, this is it. Nirvana is reached. And then about three or four months after my wedding day, I had crossed 200 pounds and then I was trying to get pregnant. So I was trying to lose weight, which is always a great way for me to gain weight. So the day I got pregnant, I was 235 pounds and that was in May of 2005. And then the day that I had Jesse, I was pretty close to 350 pounds. And that was in February of 2006. So after I had the baby, I was like, I need to lose weight. At this point, I was pre-diabetic. I had every single marker. I was having some vision problems. I was having numbness. I was having difficulty walking. I had horrible sciatica. I had a terrible pregnancy. I was having major thyroid problems. Like everything was going haywire. And um, I said, even though everything's going haywire, I am not going to lose another pound until I know that it's permanent. I have to figure out how to keep it off because I don't need to learn how to lose weight. <laughs> I need to learn how to keep it off. And I think anybody who's dealt with, clearly I had a food addiction, but anybody who's dealt with addiction, like quitting is ridiculously hard, but it's a tenth of how hard like keeping the change permanent is because it can be cute for a little while. It's like a hobby. It's an activity. And then when that wears off, um, all of a sudden you're left gaining the weight back or, you know, drinking again or whatever your, you know, distraction of choice is. You mentioned the underlying issues. So what do you mean by that, Angela? Well, for me, I thought the problem was I needed to eat less. And really, that wasn't the problem at all. I didn't know this, but what I learned in, so it's taken me 10 years to lose 100 pounds this time, about 150 or so now. And I'm still a work in progress for sure. But I stopped trying to lose weight quickly. And I started trying to figure out how was I using food to avoid life <laughs> living life on life's terms, feeling my feelings, being in the present moment. Like I hid through food. I just used food to hide who I was. So it was through, it sounds like emotional awareness um, that you became aware of all the underlying issues, which yeah. again, you're using food as, as a crutch or, you know, some and sort if there was a way to permanently lose weight without feeling a single feeling. I promise you, I would have found it. I looked really hard, <laughs> now, but it seems to be you have to feel your feelings instead of eating your emotions. Right. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, you know, you, you've been at this for a while. You know, you're, you're obviously a, a thriving entrepreneur. You've got your next big book. You're on book tour right now. Exactly. Uh, uh, make them beg uh, to publish your book is the title. Do you have a copy there? Awesome. There it is. Amazing. I'm so happy for you. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, I can't wait to get a copy for myself. But I want to know, you know, how has your own personal transformation, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's a physical transformation, but I, I do think that it, it is a, an inside out kind of transformation for you. So, you know, how has that affected your business and, and your ability to fulfill your, your mission and get your message out there? Like, are you a different person now? Uh, not only in business, actually, you know, I, I know that you've got a young boy who I know as well and, uh, and a husband who I know as well. And, you know, how, how is your whole life different now that you have, you know, become a lot more aware of your emotions and, and obviously start living a different lifestyle? Yeah, so this is what I would say to that is I thought what was going to happen was that I would lose weight and then I would have better relationships and I would have a better job and I would get a promotion and I'd get more respect for my boss. Like I thought I wasn't meeting great guys and I had terrible bosses because people always dismiss the fat girl. So I was like, okay, someday I'm going to lose weight and things will be better. And this is when I mentioned, like, this has been a 10-year journey for me. What really happened was things have been getting better, and as they get better, I don't need the weight to hide anymore. So as I'm willing to have an uncomfortable conversation with, let's say, a boss, I realized, like, oh, I actually don't want to work in corporate. So I was able to quit my job and stop expecting my job to be something it wasn't. Like I was expecting my job to be my happiness or my fulfillment because I didn't want to do that work. So I just thought my boss should do it for me. That doesn't work. Same thing with my relationships. Like I didn't want to say things. So I would just like eat and then make myself less attractive to my partner. And then my partner could leave me. And that way I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't have to have an uncomfortable conversation about something that wasn't working. So Everything in my life changed when I learned to take responsibility for my emotions, responsibility for my energy, and like be able to show up and say things, and then I didn't need to eat. So the truth is I am eating less and exercising more, but it's not like I ate less, exercised more, and then my relationships got fixed. I fixed my relationships, and then I didn't need to eat as much. So it sounds like you're just a more empowered woman. And, you know, I, I can just imagine that you've, you've always been a powerful woman, but I can almost guarantee you show up differently now in, in all areas of your life uh, as, as a, a, you know, a, a genuine, powerful woman, you know, uh, not egotistical, uh, but per perhaps more caring, more compassionate, more uh, willing to have the difficult conversations, uh, I think also perhaps um, you are concerned about yourself a lot more now, too, in the sense that, you know, things that you would let go before avoiding uncomfortable conversations, for example, um, you know, or conflicts at work or at home, perhaps get dealt with now just because of that self-care and self-compassion that you've developed and know that, that that's really where a lot of the, the, the power or energy, as you called it, is, is cultivated within you. And, and of course, it gets blocked uh, when you don't deal with those things because, you know, energy is trapped within your body and, and doesn't get released. And that's basically the the purpose of energy, it's supposed to flow. We are supposed to go with the flow. And it sounds like perhaps that's what you're doing more. There's there's some ebbs in the flow, of course, when you have to make some difficult decisions. But perhaps now you're you're willing to have those conversations, make the decisions, and, and that's why you are even more empowered versus perhaps the disempowered person that uh, to, to some degree you were before. Yeah, there's just, I think there was a lot of backlog. Like there was definitely a good five to seven years of work to clear out all that, the heavy lifting that my fat was doing for me, like keeping me at a distance from people. Like there's a lot of work losing weight emotionally, cleaning up all that stuff. And I remember saying, I actually remember saying this sentence, the scale is mean. I really believed it. It felt very real. The scale is mean. Like, so I never would stand on the scale because the scale was mean. So that seemed truthful. But it turns out the scale doesn't have a personality. <laughs> it's an inanimate object. And so now what happens is I stand on the scale pretty much every morning, kind of like you brush your teeth. It's very non-dramatic. 
And if I've gained a pound or two, I don't really pay attention. But if I've gained three or four pounds or if I'm a pound or two up for three or four days in a row, then I'll just ask myself, oh, is there something I'm holding on to? Is there a conversation I'm not having? Is there a way that I'm trying to punish myself? And usually it's something really little, like I need to tell my kid to take his toys up to his bedroom. And then I do that, and the next day, the pound is gone. Now, the pound is gone because I ate less that day. Don't get me wrong. This is all straight science. For sure, I'm eating less. But it's like, once you get over, especially when you're as heavy as I was, like, getting on the scale every day seems impossible. Like, eating less seems impossible. But now I'm like, oh, a pound is no big deal. I will just end up eating salad instead of a sandwich and it's an easy substitution and it, it just happens almost subconsciously when I deal with the underlying crap, which is probably nothing. Like most of the time it's nothing. Like when you're talking about having these hard conversations, there was 10 years, there was 20 or 30 years of fat backlog where I had to have conversations with my dad and my sisters and my mom and my bosses and my partners, like it was hard. But now it's like, hey, could you take your toys to your room? <laughs> I mean, sometimes there's something hard, but like, you know, I have a, a, a client who I love who sort of violated a copyright. Like, it's not awesome. And so I kind of know about it. And in a couple days, I'll like be like, hey, can we jump on a call and we'll have a conversation? Like, I'm not excited about it, but when it's like one uncomfortable conversation, I can handle it when it's like 20 years of, oh my God, I've been storing this up literally in piles of fat around my body. It's overwhelming. That's why I think people need a coach like you to kind of, as you're working through that, like when you are avoiding working out or when you're avoiding eating healthy, it's usually because you don't want to do this work. So bringing that stuff up and being like, Okay, you made a commitment to self-care. You made a commitment to getting a good night's sleep. You haven't done it. Let's talk about why. Because something's going on that feels easier than actually just taking care of yourself. Wow. So it sounds like you're checking in with yourself, you know, constantly. And, and almost using things like the scale as a feedback tool. It's, oh, it's giving you feedback. I think people um, who have clutter issues, it's the same thing. Like if you have a house that's filled with clutter floor to ceiling, it's going to take a while to clean that out. But then if you just notice three or four things have piled up on your desk, you just clean them up then and it's no big deal. If we get back to the state where you have to clear a path through your living room, like now we've gone to, now it's hard. Yeah, that's a great analogy actually, because, you know, I just envisioned that living room, uh, which maybe there's a few cats around too, I'm not really sure, but regardless, um, hey, that's a lot of clutter. It's gonna take a lot of time because there's going to be a lot of decisions, what to keep, what not to keep. Uh, it's not going to be done over a weekend. It's beyond spring cleaning. You know, it's about maybe a, a five year, you know, cleaning, purging kind of process. Uh, and if, if it's looked at, you know, for the people like yourself that have, have, you know, gained the weight, lost the weight, gained the weight, lost the weight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's more of a chronic thing than, you know, looking at it that and, and basing your expectations on that, you know, and, and using an analogy of, you know, another place in your life where there's a lot of cleanup and how long that would really take. You know, I always use the, the financial um, analogy in the sense that if you've ever went bankrupt before or almost went bankrupt, you know, how long did it take you to recover? And you can imagine, even if you've never been in that financial duress, that it would take some time. It's not going to be in 30 days. It's not going to be over, a, you know, a seven day <laughs> a financial cleanse. Right. It's, it's, yeah, it's probably going to take a few years. So setting your expectations from the get go on what is real, what is true, uh, and what could be compared to something that you can comprehend if you can't comprehend that, you know, the weight loss journey is just that. It is a journey that could take years. Perhaps that's a way to visualize um, the process or, you know, the road that you're going to have to travel and it will be a longer one than perhaps you expect. And I don't think I'd change it now. Like if there was, let's say there was an option, you had an option, I could just take a pill 
And you're mm. like, Angela, I have a great pill. You take it. It's very expensive. It's ten thousand dollars, but you take this pill, and tomorrow you're one hundred and twenty-five pounds. Right. I don't know that I would take that pill tomorrow. Well, Angela, they've done studies uh, for people that have had plastic surgery and they've done questionnaires, you know, why are they going in for plastic surgery? And it's to build self-esteem, build confidence, etc. And they've done confidence and self-esteem tests prior and after the surgery. And they're not increasing their self-esteem. They're the same. They're the same. And, you know, that that wasn't the objective at all. But it, it's sort of the same thing in the sense that, you know, they didn't take a pill, you know, perhaps they... They went under the knife, for example, and they expected that to be, you know, the the cure for them, uh, for, you know, the work that they weren't prepared to do. Totally. Yeah. Great analogy. So I want to ask you about your new book. Uh, yeah. What what brought this on? You're so busy helping people like me publish our books. I was surprised, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I just thought that this was going to be the, the one and only. I, I read this. This is what you taught me is an East to West book. I read this on my way back from LA, if you recall. Yeah. And, yeah. And it definitely. So this one is a similar length. Okay. So a lot of times I'll call them like a, um, I usually say Chicago, but we'll say Toronto for you. Uh, right. Toronto to LA or LA to Toronto. Um, I like to write books that you can read in a flight, a long flight, a good long flight, four or five hour flight. Um, but you could read it in a single setting. Um, so this is the exact same length. It's about 33,000 words. It'll be about 200 pages when it's printed, 190 to 200 pages. And it's big enough that you get some good meaty information, but small enough that you could finish it in a single flight or in a Saturday afternoon or something like that. And really what inspired me to write this book is a post that I saw on um, on a website that I was on. And the post was, uh, don't pay to publish your book. So the idea behind the post was, no matter what happens, you should have a publishing deal from a major publisher. And you should never pay to publish your book. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. Because when you do a deal with a major publisher, you pay a lot to publish your book. So in fact, if let's say your book was going to make $100,000, when you do a deal with a publisher, you might get $10,000 of that $100,000, but the publisher will get $90,000. Generally, publishers get between 93.5% and 80% of your revenue. So if the book's going to make $100,000, you're paying the publisher essentially 90000 of your dollars in order to publish it. Now, you don't feel it because you don't receive the $90,000 and give it to them, but you forego it for that deal. Now, there are some people who self-publish and they maybe don't spend anything. They do it themselves. And that's cool. Some people have the DIY spirit, like, I love it. That's awesome. I've seen people work out with like, they'll take water bottles and fill them with rocks. Like some people buy barbells, but you don't have to. You could, you don't need a kettlebell. You could swing a Campbell soup can. Like it's all good. <laughs> That's cool. And then there are people in the middle who make a decision to invest in professionals to get their book done in a way that looks professional or that just frees up their time to do their thing. And we don't, I'm, I'm a book coach. I help people write their books. So we don't charge people to publish their books, but we do work with lots of people who charge people to publish their books. And I think paying upfront, if you understand the business model, can be a much more cost-effective way to go. So it could be that you spend $10,000 to publish your book and you make the 90000 as opposed to, a publisher paying you 10000 and they make the 90000 So we could have the you spend nothing and you make a little. We could have the you spend a little and you make a lot. Or we could have a somebody fronts you the money and they make a lot. Those are all scenarios. But either way, you're paying. You're paying mm -hmm. in time or you're paying. What did people say? You can't get nothing for nothing. Mm -hmm. like, you will be paying in some fashion. The question is for you as an author, how do you want to pay? 
do you want to pay up front? Do you want to pay on the back end, pay more on the back end, pay more up front? It's all good, but I want you to be responsible for that. So I had this conversation and I got into like a fight. I was like trolled on a Facebook group and I got into a fight. I'm like, dude, I do, this is terrible advice. Here's why I think some people should pay. And there was this, you know, chaos as if I was a pariah. And I'm like, I think the rules have changed. And I think it's time to share those new rules with authors so that they can take responsibility for their own success. Yeah, well, Angela, you know, as as I saw it eventually, because I didn't see this right away, you know, I was a uh, diehard DIY, you know, 10 years. Um, and actually, you know what the epiphany moment was? It was from one of my clients at my fitness club. And uh, we were featuring him as a star profile. He did really well, weight loss, fitness, et cetera. And uh, the quote uh, that we pulled from the story was, if I could have done it myself, I would have done it five years ago. And boom, that just hit me. And I realized, you know, in a different context, that's exactly where I was with writing my book. So I started to see it as an investment. Um, and and I, I really had to, you know, break my belief system. I had to uh, let go of ego. Um, I had to accept help, your help and your staff's help. Uh, but I know that the book would be entirely different. I had a rough manuscript, Angela, that was about 77,000 words. <laughs> we ended up with 32,000. And it's a completely different style of book that I could have ever imagined because, you know, I, I really didn't know what my message was. Mm -hmm. I was always all over the map. And, um, you know, I didn't know all of the, the inner workings that, hey, you know, if I want this to happen and, you know, I should have realized this. I'm, I'm a business person. You know, I'm an entrepreneur that I would have to sacrifice something, you know, and usually in the business world, it's called money. It's called an investment. It's called, you know, getting a return on your investment. And that's essentially what I've got with this book, because I tell you, this book it was a birthing process. That's what we always refer to, right? Uh, you and I and the other authors. Yeah, birthing your book. It's not easy, obviously. And it's not easy because you make us, um, with distinction, clarify what our message is. And we, we have to do that. And in doing so, what ends up happening is we have this message that we can take out on some, so many different platforms. You know, I have an online course now, for example. Uh, we're planning on a big seminar. And it's all going to be based on the message that was forged in the book. Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. I love that. Yeah, it really is. So I, I want you to... Um, this is... So I did this um, free training. It's a 19-minute class. And if people go to, and obviously we spent three days locked in a castle together, so it's just a taste of it. But if people go to quartermillionbook.com, mm -hmm. okay. it's a 19 minute class that teaches you exactly how to make a quarter of a million dollars from your book. Amazing. And that's my goal. And look, if you make a quarter of a million dollars from your book, you can get publishers begging to publish your book, or you can do it on your own. Like you have the choice, you have the flexibility then. So you can actually write your own ticket. And for some people, that is going with a traditional publisher. And for some people, it's not. Hi, Majid. So, Angela, I wanted to ask you if there is other people, um, you know, watching this video right now that were in that same stuck place that I was for so long. You know, what's the best advice that you could give to them? Best advice is... If you can't sell your book before you write it, you will not be able to sell it after you write it. So don't finish your book. Don't sit in your hole, your cabin in Maine, finish your book and then think, oh, I'm going to hire a marketing person who's going to help me market this. Most books are unmarketable. 80% of the marketing for your book happens in how you write it. So go ahead and sell whatever you're selling in the book. Start selling it before you even put a word on the paper. And make sure you have your messaging down before you get that book published. And do it in a narrow window. Like I normally recommend about 90 days for the whole process. So 
That's what I would say is limit the amount of time and really focus on getting something sellable. You'll know it sells if people buy it. So easy way, sell first, then write. Yes, exactly, Najid. He, he's, he's been locked in the castle with me for three days too. Yes, so, yes. You've mentored so many of us, so many of my friends. And yeah, and uh, life is definitely better uh, when you're a published author just because you have so much more confidence in, in what you're doing, what you're up to, what's important to you, what your mission is. You know, all these things become clear after you go through the birthing process of writing a book. Um, I want to thank you for being on with us, Angela. This has been amazing. How can people get in touch with you? You gave us a link for the free training. Uh, if you want to give that link again, and also if there's any other ways. Go to Amazon and buy Make Them Beg <laughs> to publish your book. Make them beg to publish your book on Amazon for sure. I actually think it's still free for about three or four more hours. So if you mm -hmm. haven't gotten it, you can go to Amazon.com. You can go to Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, where whatever your Amazon is, type in Make Them Beg to publish your book, and you will find it. Or you can type in my name, Angela Loria. And uh, the other place that you can go to is Quarter Million Book. Dot com quarter million book dot com that'll give you that free training on how to make a quarter million dollars from your book amazing i'm wishing you so much success with your new book and so good to like see you in person i love this i love this be live it's super fun oh well, yeah you're live from washington dc uh, i just have to on a final note uh, tell everyone about my experience in the author's castle um, I was in the, uh, I'm going to say Tom Sawyer because for some Mark Twain room, but yes, it is the Tom my Sawyer. is going to kill me. I can never remember that author's name, but I was overlooking, uh, and I forget the river's name, of course. My river. Thank that you. Room has the best view. <laughs> I, I might have all of the, uh, uh, the names wrong or I can't remember, but what I do remember though is, is just that setting. It was absolutely beautiful. We had, uh, uh, American bald eagles uh, flying around the Potomac River. You know, I was perched up there in, in that room, writing on my suitcase with my laptop, you coming in, seeing how I was doing. I don't know. think you moved for three days. Yeah, yeah, I know. I Sometimes know. I walk by that room and I can still see the ghost of you sitting on the edge of the bed. So I want to thank you personally for helping me make a difference because that's exactly... Well, your book up. That was mine. <laughs> yes, I know it was yours because you've helped me make a difference. And there is the difference in, in what is in this book and the difference that it's making in people's lives that I'm now able to touch uh, much more than I was in the past. Uh, more people, more results. And just uh, I'm, a, I'm in a happier place right now being able to do what I always knew, know, knew what I was meant to do, essentially. So love that. Love you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Majid, for finding it in Canada. Post the link. I don't know how to post the link for Be Live, but um, yeah, we'll do that now. So, Angela, thank you. Bye, you guys. Bye. -bye. Ciao.